Okay, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our three guest panel speakers today, starting with Steve Lockwood, who's an independent financial crime consultant, having previously worked in both law enforcement and at the UK Financial Regulator. He works with clients to assess the design and operational effectiveness of their financial crime compliance programs and delivers FC program remediation projects. He has delivered projects across much of Northern Europe, Australasia and Africa. Marcina Hunter is the thematic lead on extractives and illicit flows of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Marcina has been with the Global Initiative since 2013 and during her time there has analysed a wide range of crime types in various geographies. She currently focuses on illicit activity in the extractive sector, in particular specialising in gold-related crimes, illicit financial flows and development impacts of and responses to organised crime. She's also been a casual research fellow at the University of Queensland, Sustainable Minerals Institute, and has served as an expert advisor for various UN organisations, national governments, NGOs, and private companies. Originating from the US, Marcina holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Denver and a Juris Doctor from Washington and Lee University School of Law. Noemi Tambe is a financial crime consultant and researcher with professional experience within PSPs, reg techs, think tanks, government and, pri and private and retail banking. She is an associate professor at Luxembourg School of Business, an associate fellow at the Centre for Financial Crime and Security Studies, as well as a faculty member and expert trainer at the Global Compliance Institute. She provides technical thematic support and thought leadership on anti-money laundering, counter-finance terrorism and counter-proliferation finance. Her experience spans the UK, Luxembourg, Estonia and Mexico with a particular focus on financial intelligence units and private banking. She has managed high profile investigations focused on anti-money laundering and delivered projects for compliance control environment, processes improvement, remediation and reputational risks management. Welcome and thank you to all our panelists for agreeing to our discussion today. The focus on sanctions has grown globally in the last few years, where it was seen as either a bolt-on or a poor relation to anti-money laundering. It's now very much a standalone process subject to strict regulatory scrutiny. What makes these regulations stand out is their agile, evolving landscape, which firms need to keep abreast of. I'll take you through a series of questions with our panellists. For those listening online, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please type your question in the chat function and we'll get to them if time permits or respond after the webinar. So Stephen, I'd like to start, uh, kick us off with a question to you, if I may. Could you tell us who are affected by sanctions rules? Um, yes, well, I suppose the, the, the short answer is that everyone is, is affected by sanction rules. And, and that is one of the main differences uh, between <clears throat> Uh, sanctions and other elements uh, of your financial crime program so by way of example uh, here in the UK all UK firms and uh, based firms and, and individuals based in the UK and UK firms and individuals abroad are all subject to the UK sanctions regimes uh, and consequently this means that the considerations uh, are broader within organisations or should be broader than for other similar controls. So your your control environment, because of the, the, the scope of sanctions, needs to go beyond that of customers and, and transactions. You, you need to consider the sanction risks that are posed by your sector, your geographical exposure and, 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 and your subsidiaries within your business. Um, you also need to consider um, your suppliers and your third parties and whether or not you as an organisation need to be aware of their sanctions uh, control programmes, just as the chances are those parties will want to understand what your sanction control programme looks like as well, just because of the, the far reaching control. Um, on a more granular level within your organisation, you also need to think about your staff uh, and, and, and other areas of your operations as well. And so, uh, by way of example, your, your travel policy. So 
which airlines are you using which hotels are you staying at because all of these parts of your operation all these parts of your business will fall within the remit of, of the sanction uh, regime so 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 really in summary it's it's all firms and it's all individuals <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so really, it does appear that, you know, sanctions is a really broad reaching area. And, and as you said, affects a whole different lot of sectors. It's not just financial services. It's, it's a whole lot of different sectors. So, uh, Marcina, turning to you, your specialisation is in relation to illicit activity in the extractive sector. And you specialise, amongst other things, on gold related crimes. Can you tell us why gold is an attractive vehicle? for sanctions evasion, as well as broader criminal activity and illicit financial flows? Thank you, Aruna. Yes, gold has a number of inherent characteristics that makes it really attractive, not just for sanctions evasion, but for illicit activity in general. Starting with um, global liquidity, gold is seen as a viable financial vehicle um, globally around the world and in many locations or cultures is highly valued and can even be exchanged um, for goods in some cases. And it also offers anonymity. It's um, impossible to trace the origins of gold once it is melted. And so it's very easy to disguise where gold came from or who have may previously have owned it. And then also the regulations of the gold sector are less stringent or more difficult to implement, I would say, than um, the financial banking sector. And so it does give individuals a way of moving value and finances out of more formal financial banking systems. And another um, attractive element of gold is that it is easily moved. Um, while it is perhaps perceived as really bulky or maybe difficult to move, um, it actually does have a high volume to value ratio. And so let's say a million or a billion dollars of gold could be relatively easily moved um, depending on the person and their goals. And also gold offers an opportunity to launder funds into formal financial systems because illicit finances or maybe money that is held by sanctioned individual or company or that sort of thing could be used to buy gold anonymously. And then that gold can be moved um, rather than the funds themselves as a money laundering mechanism. So those are some of the ways um, how gold can be used and why it is especially attractive for sanctions evasion. It's funny when you're talking about gold and, and melting it down and it's losing its identity. I'm, you know, I have a flash of that scene in that Die Hard movie where they actually rob the, the bank and they just take bars and bars and bars of gold. And you just realize, you know, they've, they've just taken the wealth of the world with obviously the intention to, to melt it down and to get it, you know, into another format. Um, yes. <laughs> so, I'm um, loving Stephen the reference to the uh, to iconic movies. This is good. Yes. <laughs> Love my movies. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Stephen, if I could come back to you, I guess based on like what Marcina was talking about, for example, we talk about gold as one mechanism of, of you know, currency moving across industries. I'm assuming that the development of an effective sanctions program is really critical for, for institutions. How does the risk assessment component factor into the development of an effective sanctions program? Um, so, so from a regulatory perspective, the, um, the risk assessment um, is, is the foundational element of any anti-financial crime program. And, and sanctions um, are no exception. So in order to evidence that you, you have a well-designed and a well-operating um, uh, sanctions or financial crime program, you need to be able to demonstrate that it is capable of mitigating the unique risks faced by your, your firm. And, and really, the only way to do that is through uh, an effective risk assessment. Um, the, the way I like to think about it is uh, all, all, all programmes um, the different elements are the building blocks. 
and they all rely on the strength of what lies beneath it. And so you'll have your foundational element of your risk assessment. And then once you understand what your risks, you can develop your, um, your controls that are going to mitigate and manage those risks. And once you have your controls, you can assess your inherent risk and, and, and so on and so forth to, to understand you know, what you require to have an effective programme. Um, we all we use this phrase, don't we, in regulation, the risk based approach. Well, um, in essence, if, <laughs> if you don't know what your risks are, you're not going to be able to, to, to take a risk based approach. Um, so when we're when we're developing um, programmes and particularly, I would say, sanctions programmes, um, we very much uh, put a focus on the, the technical elements of the programme. So things like your fuzzy logics, uh, your, your list management. And, and these are all, are all key, key, um, key factors. But equally as important is to step back and, and just ask ourselves if tomorrow um, there was a breach and a, and a regulator came in uh, to conduct an investigation can we hand on heart say that we did everything we reasonably could do to to prevent that um, uh, event from taking place? Because even with the best designed sanction programs, there is still a risk that there might be a, a sanctioned event. So what will happen if a regulator comes in with the investigators? Um, the first thing they're going to ask you for is your risk assessment. And what they'll do is they'll take your risk assessment and they'll map it out to your controls, to the regulation, to uh, best practice, to what peers are saying. They'll look at global uh, sanction events that have been reported. <laughs> and if that compliance um, event, if the sanction event has crystallized in a part of your business that you've not identified or, 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 or missed, you need to ask yourself how are you going to demonstrate to a regulator that you've taken or you did take reasonable steps to prevent that from happening and if you don't know what your risks are then it's very difficult to design effective controls to mitigate them so yeah i would say the risk assessment is is foundation and fundamentally you could have a huge list of controls but if you haven't done a robust thorough thoughtful risk assessment the control mechanisms themselves are meaningless because it's it, it, you really haven't done the, the the assessment, right? I mean, risk assessment is kind of a, a part of our lives every day. You step out the door and decide you're going to catch the bus or the train. You know, uh, in, is is it raining? Am I walking? Am I? You know, there's a minor risk assessment going through every part of our lives. But you know, in, in when it comes to what we're talking about here, it's going to be you know really done thoroughly and robustly. Um, so, um, Naomi, I, I'd like to turn to you uh, and, you know, um, you're a specialist in counter-proliferation financing. Um, could you just talk us through uh, some of the core counter-proliferation measures? Yeah. Just for the benefit of those who may not understand what, what counter-proliferation really is about. Yes, uh, thanks, Aruna. Uh, so yeah, before I talk about the measures, I think like you, you like you point out, it's key to really understand what uh, proliferation is all about. And proliferation um, is essentially about acquiring, developing programs uh, of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and typically, when we talk about weapons of mass destruction, we're automatically thinking about North Korea, of course, as well as Iran. Those are our state actors, your typical state actors that are being targeted by um, UN resolutions. But we also talk about, um, we also uh, think about intermediaries. Uh, so um, the famous um, uh, uh, proliferator uh, Abdul Qadir Khan, originating from Pakistan, is a well-known uh, uh, proliferator who supported a number of different states uh, in their acquisition of, uh, of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, but we also talk about uh, uh, terrorists because none of us want terrorists to get their hands on uh, on nuclear weapons, on um, uh, ballistic missiles, or uh, on uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, so this is essentially what we mean by proliferation. Now, moving on to understand, you know, your your typical counter proliferation measures. I obviously come from a from a banking background, so. 
obviously at the national level, uh, like, like Stephen has pointed out, you want to do your, your risk assessments, to what extent is your jurisdiction exposed to those kind of threats, to those kinds of vulnerabilities. But if I go to the sort of more granular level and look at you know, institutions, what's really key is for institutions who are most of the time, and I, I see that with a number of my different clients, under-resourced, it's absolutely key to do a risk assessment, uh, absolutely, and then to really identify the existing controls uh, uh, and, and mechanisms and frameworks that we have within our institutions that we can leverage in order to really target uh, uh, um, the risk of uh, financing proliferation. So what are the risks, for instance, of um, if you're a notary, for instance, of establishing a front company without even knowing it for a proliferator, which is exactly what Mossack Fonseca uh, did. Uh, and everybody would have heard of, uh, of Mossack Fonseca in the Panama Papers. Um, yeah. So, or similarly, um, what are the risks of, um, of using your, uh, your correspondent uh, uh, banking account to launder and to essentially transfer funds back to North Korea? Yeah. So I would say that you know your traditional counter proliferation measures uh, can really leverage your typical uh, existing frameworks for that target money laundering prevention uh, and uh, terrorism financing prevention. Great, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, and yes, I, I remember last year one of the things I. I you know, my husband made me watch was a, a thing on Netflix, I think, on the Panama Papers, which was a revelation really to, to understand the, the whole structure. Um, so what do you see as the challenges for the private sector in implementing financing risk assessments as required under the Financial Action Task Force or FADEF's recommendation one? I think the main challenge is the fact that you do not necessarily have a, you, well, it's not necessarily, you do not have at this point in time a, a clear uh, definition of what proliferation finance is. Um, so this is, you know, the starting block. So how how do you then ensure that you have the right legislation in place that then trickles down to what needs to be done across the private sector. This would be, you know, a first uh, first challenge. The second challenge is that um, I often advocate for the for the private sector coming from the private sector. I always say um, that we are increasingly that regulators are increasingly outsourcing. AML, CTF, and now CPF, counterproliferation finance, to the private sector. But obviously that comes with responsibilities of liability, right, and of stepping up to the mark and providing the right level of guidance and support for the private sector to do the right thing. And if there is a great challenge around the private sector in terms of understanding proliferation, understanding um, the you know dual use goods. So one of, you know, if you work as a compliance officer in your trade finance team, you are expected to understand that, this specific um, a metal sheet is actually a dual use good versus the other metal sheet that is not because of, I don't know, X, Y, and Z reason that this specific centrifuge is a dual use good, whereas another uh, centrifuge is not again, for specificities that to someone who's not an engineer or working uh, in an institution would not necessarily understand. So this is a key challenge as well. We really need to ensure that there's the right level of support for individuals working within financial institutions to understand uh, to, to understand that. And I do not think having worked with a number of different institutions across a number of different jurisdictions, I'm still to see that level of support. And even when you watch the, um, I think the FATF a couple of years ago, I must say with COVID, my, my, my time frame is all muddled, but I think it's, it was a couple of years ago, the FATF organized the webinar around risk assessments and it's very you know it's it's instructive but genuinely after an hour watching it you know as as an mlro you're walking and you go okay well what can i do practically what genuinely practically what have i learned that I, and not much right i had five bullet points of my on my a4 uh, so i think this is a key challenge having the right level of guidance uh, the right level of guidance um, and then, of course, is ensuring that jurisdictions uh, uh, perform their own national risk assessment. You are expecting private institutions to do their risk assessments, but if a number of jurisdictions have not done their own national risk assessments in relation to proliferation finance risk, then 
you know, to what extent can you really expect the private sector to take the lead? Or maybe you do want them to take the lead, but then that needs to be clearly communicated and uh, and socialized uh, across. Um, and then a third challenge, of course, is ensuring that you are the, you have the right level as a financial institution, the right level of um, involvement or relationship with relevant agencies. So of course, then this would lead us into, uh, you know, public private partnerships, which of course is not, this is not what today is about, but you need to be able to liaise with your um, your trade department, with your export import control team. You need to be, you know, within your jurisdiction, you need to be able to have the right level conversation with, um, you know, uh, uh, port controls. Um, and, and I'm not sure that jurisdictions necessarily have this this sort of those sort of partnerships in place to really support the private sector in ensuring that they that they meet um, the FATF standards. So there's it sounds like there's a lot of work ahead and fundamentally really understanding what the you know recommendation one is, but then you know what's the translation of that within institution? How do we train people? How do we make sure that they've got the right policies, procedures, guidance documents? Uh, monitoring mechanisms, escalation mechanisms, all of these different components, which as with any new regulation that comes in, you've, you've got to have. But it sounds like there's a fairly steep learning curve ahead for, for the yeah. financial sector. I think there is because, and, and very briefly, because we said I don't want to take time away from Marcina and Stephen, but very briefly, I think what's important to, to note is that we are, as, as anti-financial crime practitioners, we are, whether we like it or not, formatted to understand the world through the lens of money laundering prevention and terrorism financing prevention. And whilst there are a number of similarities with proliferation finance, there are other, you know, there are a number of differences as well. And the sooner we, we understand that and we are able to navigate that, the better. And what's important to note is that at the end of the day, proliferation finance is really about uh, or the, the the prevention of proliferation finance is really about understanding how a regime is obtaining its finance. It's really about you know understanding the nexus with Iran and North Korea, which may not sound like much, but when we've been formatted all those years around money laundering prevention, terrorism financing prevention, making that switch is not necessarily that straightforward. It's it's doable, but it's not that straightforward. Yeah, but I think the financial services industry will have to, or, you know, industries in general will have to get with the program, just like they had to make the switch into what is anti-money laundering and what is, you know, managing counter-terrorism uh, financing. And I remember, you know, a number of years ago, from an Australian point of view, when the government first introduced, like, the identification regime for, you know, uh, bank account products and stuff, we all had to learn, we all had to get with the program, we all had to make sure that we, we covered it, and, and, and the same thing will will we know, apply. Um, now, Marcina, I'd like to come back to you uh, and ask you uh, a little bit more, go into a little bit more depth uh, in relation to gold. Given the focus on detection of illicit flows and the importance of having a program to detect this, how has got, how can and has gold been used to actually evade sanctions? So we talked a little bit about its value and how it once it's melted down, it sort of it loses its identity, it can't be traced. But can you can you go into a little bit more detail around how it's used to evade sanctions as well? Yes. So gold can be used by individuals or companies, but um I think what Naomi brought up about regimes is also really important because uh, we have a couple of prominent examples of regimes in the past actually using gold to evade sanctions. Um, one of perhaps some more um, notable and relevant ones here is the Turkey and Iran gas for gold scheme, um, which took place um, predominantly in 2012. And here, Turkey purchased Iranian uh, gas in Turkish lira, which was then used um, by Iranian gold traders to buy gold in Turkey. The lira was used to buy gold in Turkey. And so that um, gold was then moved to the United Arab Emirates, UAE, um, and Iran, where then it was used to, um, the gold was sold for foreign exchange that propped up uh, Tehran's uh, foreign exchange reserves. Um, under the sanctions regime at the time, 
this was legal as long as the payments were not made to the government of Iran, which was um, highly likely to be happening in practice. Um, the loophole was plugged in January 2013, but it's thought that during um, this scheme, Turkey exported $15 billion in gold, um, including wow. $5.3 billion to Iran and $7.9 billion worth of gold to the UAE. So we are talking about pretty significant sums that yeah. are being used by um, regimes to um, circumvent financial systems. A more recent example is Venezuela. In 2014, um, Venezuela was the target of successive waves of US sanctions, as well as UK and EU sanctions. Um, and in 2019, the U.S. blacklisted um, the Central Bank of Venezuela, almost completely isolating it from the global financial system. Um, subsequently, it is highly suspected that Russia, um, which was supporting Venezuela, helped supply Russian planes to move Venezuelan gold to various foreign markets to evade sanctions. And this is tons of gold. So again, we're talking about really significant values here. Um, and destinations for that included, again, Uganda, Turkey, and the UAE. And this gold was then sold for, again, foreign exchange, such as US dollars and euros, which then could be returned to Venezuela or used to purchase um, necessary items or to pay um, military or supporters. Um, so those are two kind of prominent examples of how gold has been known to circumvent sanctions in the past. Mm -hmm. um, currently, there are also um, allegations or suspicions of gold that is produced by um, Russian mining companies um, in Africa that have been um, smuggled out of the countries and falsely declared as having a different origin in order to um, circumvent sanctions on those companies. Um, there's allegations of that. And um, recently, I don't know if you would actually say it's sanctions evasion, but there have been really recent reports that Russia is working with Iran on a gold-backed digital asset um, to enable oh. trade on fuel. And so while it's not necessarily um, legally sanctions of Asia, maybe, um, it is ways that gold and especially gold and crypto, um, kind of these alternative financial vehicles are being looked at in creative ways to uh, evade um, global financial systems and banking systems and that sort of thing. And to provide um, a sort of anonymity to these mm. regimes or companies seeking to evade sanctions. Wow, those are some really big numbers that you talked about as well. So um, <clears throat> it's really interesting. Um, so Naomi, um, if we could come back to you. So you touched on briefly, you mentioned before, um, the financial financing national risk assessment. So what conclusions might be drawn from the proliferation financing national risk assessments that have been published so far by countries in accordance with um, FATF's recommendation one? And where do you start when considering the proliferation financing risk and risk assessment for a particular country or jurisdiction? What's the starting point? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll probably answer the, first, the second question first. I think where, where you start um, as, a, as a jurisdiction is to really understand what um you know what the threats are you know really understand what are what are the risks you know what are the proliferation finance risks that are out there that are likely to to threaten my my jurisdiction um and how likely am i as an insti as a as a jurisdiction how vulnerable am i to to those threats so we've really you know we've talked about 
the threats, of course, of you know North Korea or or uh, let let's go for for North Korea uh, wanting to to build a, a program of weapons of mass destruction, you know, using using front companies, uh, for instance, uh, or um, smuggling uh, smuggling gold, for instance. The, you know, the, you have such typologies as well in the, in the case of, of North Korea. Um, and and as an institution, uh, uh, sorry, as a jurisdiction, how how vulnerable am I to that? So the first thing you would you would you would ask yourself is, um, do I have a big financial center? You know, am I am I a big financial center either uh, worldwide or for my specific region? Um, so the UK, London, for instance, the UK is a big financial corporate uh, center. Um, similarly, South Africa as well is a big uh, financial center for, for its region. Um, another element as well is, you know, do I have a big industry that manufactures dual use good? Mm. Uh, that, you know, uh, intermediaries, uh, proliferators, uh, states will want to get uh, their hands on. So the US, for instance, is uh, such uh, such uh, 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 an example? Um, do I have another example as well? Is do I have a big research center? Do I have the next uh, Einstein's and Oppenheimer's studying, doing research in my jurisdiction? Um, again, uh, you know, the UK, for instance, is such an example. So it's really breaking down your um, your economics. Really understand uh, understanding your the your financial sector, your economic sector, your industrial sector, and really understand to what extent you are likely to be vulnerable or not to the threats of North Korea or Iran. And you may also something as well that is key to highlight is understanding your the political elements of it, the historical ties that you may or may not have with North Korea. You have a number of countries in the um, in in Africa, for instance, uh, notably South Africa. That's another good example. That was really supported by North Korea uh, to uh, to tackle uh, apartheid or to tackle colonialism. Um, so that creates strong historical ties. Uh, do you have a? Do you live in a jurisdiction that has such ties? Because it's not so easy to to uh, remove and cut such ties. Um, do you have a legal framework that is weak, that does not have the right level of legislation? Do you have export import controls that are weak or that are badly implemented? So those are all elements as a as a jurisdiction that you need to to uh, to be cognizant of when performing your risk assessment to really understand to what extent threats of of you know using your country are likely to materialize because of the vulnerabilities that you are that you are displaying. Um, in terms of good examples, you know, there are a number of national risk assessments that have been published around proliferation finance risk. Um, the UK has published one, Malaysia has published one, um, the US has published one. Uh, I know that I'm missing a couple more uh, on the top of my head. Maybe I haven't had enough coffee this morning. Um, so uh, my, my apologies. But what is in, what is for me the main takeaways uh, is, and that's something that I think we always you know, uh, uh, come across in our line of work as risk practitioner is the subjectivity of risk. So, you know, to give you a quick, like little anecdote, I remember doing a piece of work um, for a client that involved me talking to um, someone that was based in a, um, a, a Southeast Asian country, which as far as I'm concerned is high risk. But when I was talking to this investment banker working in that specific country, as far as they were concerned, you know, they were not. And I used to work and live in Estonia. And I remember Estonia telling me how high risk Austria was, you know, when I was talking to some of their, their practitioners. And of course, a couple of years later, Danske Bank happened and suddenly Estonia became extremely high risk uh, for laundering the money of rich uh, Russian billionaires. So there's always this level of, of subjectivity when you're in it. You don't necessarily appreciate and understand to what extent your jurisdiction or your or your um, uh, even institution uh, is is risky or not, and that's something that I I must say I'm very aware of when I'm reading those national risk assessments. Um, so always be cognizant of the subjectivity of risk. This is not an absolute value, right? It's very much in the eye of the of the beholder. Um, but in terms of uh, of the key takeaways. 
um, I think I really liked, to be honest, the the, the US and the UK uh, uh, national risk assessments. They have a really good grasp of, okay, what are our vulnerabilities? Uh, I think the threats could have been articulated a bit better. You know, they talk about North Korea. Yeah, we, we know uh, it is a threat. Uh, Iran, yes, we know it is a threat. But really, this, so this maybe could have been articulated a little bit better. But I think overall, um, it's, an, it's a very interesting read in terms of really understanding the vulnerabilities of their industries, the vulnerabilities of um, of their research centers, the, the vulnerabilities um, or the strength of their of their frameworks. So for anyone who's uh, watching us today, who's really struggling to really understand and articulate what we understand, what we mean by proliferation finance threat, proliferation finance vulnerabilities, I would highly suggest that they that they consult those uh, those national risk assessment documents. And just very last final point. Uh, Looking at other national risk assessments, like, such as the one for Malaysia, for instance, is key because you really see how a different uh, a region is obviously facing completely different threats and has obviously completely different vulnerabilities to a jurisdiction such as the US or the UK. So it's really, really key to make sure that you consult um, different NRAs uh, across the globe and ideally leverage from, the NR from, from NRAs whose countries are more or less uh, have more or less a similar profile, let's say, to your own jurisdiction. You cannot compare, let's say, uh, if, I, if I'm doing an NRA for Vietnam, I am not very likely to be able to learn much from the, uh, I don't know, the, the US uh, National Risk Assessment, which will have a completely different profile, right? And I might be completely wrong because I know nothing mm -hmm. about Vietnam. So if anyone is watching us tells us, no, actually, uh, you're completely wrong, Noemi. Uh, but I would assume that it does not quite have the same same profile. So it's very important to really try to learn from, from the jurisdictions that are best aligned or more aligned to your to your own. Right, right. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. I think so the you know subjective nature of the risk assessment is is something that uh, you know, as you say, when you're in it, your perspective is completely different to, to somebody looking from the outside. Yeah, there's always um, no heuristics to it, right? So absolutely. Mm, mm. Um, I was going to ask uh, Stephen the next question, but I think he's having some technical issues. So hopefully we'll get him back online before before we finish up um, and we can talk a little bit more. I specifically wanted to ask him a question in relation to, excuse me, subjective nature of risk assessments and then how that feeds into you know uh, developing a, a good sanctions program but um hi Aruna um, Stephen's yeah. had a blackout unfortunately so oh no I'd be back with it yes yeah, so he's had a power cut oh, oh dear. dearing me <clears throat> well we'll see, have, keep our fingers crossed that we, we'll get Stephen back um so Marcina um you know given what a lot of institutions will be facing uh, as challenges to sort of, you know, make sure that they manage what they need to from a sanctions regime point of view, understanding the sanctions risk, you know, having done adequate sanctions, a risk assessment and putting uh, together programs. What, do you, what can you tell us what are some of the current relevant sanctions regimes and risks relating to the gold sector? So sanctions on gold um, were brought in fairly early um, in the, I guess you could call the new wave of sanctions. Um, it was identified as a vulnerability fairly early on. And so today we have um, sanctions by the US, the UK, the EU, Switzerland, as well as other governments specifically identifying gold in sanctions regimes on um, Russian sanctions regimes. And this um, includes, it's evolving. So it um, includes gold that, that was produced in Russia um, after February, 2022. But there have been some recent updates around um, gold held by Russian, um, sanctioned Russian, Russian individuals, that sort of thing. So while I would say that um, kind of across the border generally, especially in some of the major gold trading hubs of 
Um, the UK, Switzerland, and the US all have sanctions on um, uh, relating to Russia. Um, it is continuing to evolve a bit. Um, another, it's not Russian, but the US has also re recently brought in sanctions on the Nicaraguan gold sector um, and um, sanctions on Venezuela still remain relevant. Um, thinking about some of the um, challenges that institutions are facing and current risks, um, there has been a lot of movement of wealth from Russia to the UAE. Um, it, the UAE is a major gold um, market globally, um, transit point. And so having that um, convergence of financial flows, um, transit and trade hubs, and also a very, very large gold market does present opportunity there for gold to be um, used to evade sanctions or engage in other types of illicit activity. Uh, another um, uh, flow that we've seen is increased flows between Russia and China. Um, before the invasion, um, the UK was the largest importer of Russian gold, importing billions of dollars worth of gold. Um, but that flow has been cut off and Russia is looking for other buyers. So um, we do see China being um, a destination for that. Um, it, not necessarily sanctions evasion, but, but we are seeing countries um, try to, I think, sanctions proof their economies or become more resilient to sanctions. And so recently we've seen um, uh, historical highs or large, very high in central banks buying gold. Um, and so that has been a big uptake. And also trying to, I think, uh, de-dollarize or protect their economies because the U.S. does um, have a particular role of influence um, due to the U.S. dollar in transactions that uh, are done in U.S. dollars, the role of secondary, secondary sanctions on those transactions. And so as governments and individuals try to shift away from the US dollar, um, gold uh, does present um, an option there. Uh, and I think just to maybe speak about a final risk is um, Russian gold producers in Africa. Um, and I think the Wagner Group has also been in headlines uh, quite frequently in their role in various African countries, including CAR, Sudan, um, there are concerns about um, Russian presence in Mali and gold there, although I think these are yet to be substantiated. But going forward, this will again be something to watch because there is pretty significant gold production um, in Sudan and some of these other countries. And so looking at how that gold and partnerships with African countries um, may be used to evade sanctions or forge new new or reinforce old political alliances. Um, and I think the role of fuel in considering the relationship between gold and fuel is important here. For example, mm -hmm. um, there's been reporting in Ghana um, speculating about um, establishing a gold for petrol scheme because with inflation and petrol prices and that sort of thing um, it's really had a negative impact on the economy there and so using gold to pay for petrol has been proposed as a way to address these challenges and so as we go forward um, really thinking I think about gold as a financial vehicle and how it can be used in various ways by um, regimes as well as individuals and companies to evade sanctions as well as sanction proof or protect themselves against sanctions or economic shocks. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting. There's a lot of challenges ahead, I think, by the sounds of it for 
you know, those jurisdictions um, that you mentioned. Um, Stephen, welcome back. Glad to see you. you we're able to join us again. Um, so listen, I'm, I'm gonna go straight to you uh, with a question. So we've spoken about how sanctions is a constantly and quickly evolving landscape and Noemi touched on before the subjective nature of the risk assessment as well, which you've mentioned before the importance of the thorough risk assessment, because uh, that's what a regulator is going to look at first, but then you have this subjective nature. Um, what do you see as the main challenges for an organisation in staying up to date with this constantly evolving landscape and ensuring that their program is adequate and will set, stand up to not only regulatory scrutiny, but actually protect the institution and its underlying customers. Okay, yeah, so uh, for, apologies for dropping off, I had technical issues, but um, yeah, so for, for, for all the reasons we've discussed, um, developing an adequate sanctions program is, it, it, it is a challenging process. Um, and I think um, you said at the start, and I, I completely agree that the sanctions regime globally is it's fast paced. It's, it, it, it's evolving constantly. Um, so for for individual firms in their development of their sanctions program, we need to recognise that that this isn't a one size fits all control. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that firms need to develop um sanctioned programs that, that are that are reflective and, and unique to the risks that they as an organization face so you can't rely on generic controls you can't rely on on the more sort of templated generic risk assessments but more they need to be they need to be very much um bespoke um, because part of the regular test is to come in and as we've discussed before you know is how are you mitigating your your risk, the risk that you face within your your um, your business, um, and because of that, one of the one of the the, the, the challenges is the frequency with, with which you're going to have to update, develop your program and your risk assessments. Where traditionally, within within some of the more established control environments, we we talk about this annual refresh. We say we do our control testing, we do our our our, our audit annually. Well, mm. the challenge for sanctions is that it's such a fast paced environment that it's likely that you're not going to be able to keep pace within an effective program if you're only looking at it annually. So you, because you have two factors, you have the external factors that we've discussed about mm. the global, team, but you have the internal factors as well about the growth of your business, the, the, yes. the markets you operate in the products that you're, you're offering, the new businesses that you're, you're working with, you're partnering with. Mm. Um, and so your programme evolution needs to keep pace with those external factors, which, which obviously is, is a burden on a business. Um, I think as compliance professionals, it's our duty to consider downstream impacts and the mm. operational side of things as well. Um, too often people will, will sort of decide what the rules are and then say right we need to imp 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 implement these these new controls mm -hmm. but it's it's being cognizant of the fact that there is finite resource there is there is finite sort of uh, budget within these operational programs it takes yes. long time to, to update and implement an it system you know this we Gosh, don't flick, yeah. you, don't, you don't flick a switch you know <laughs> no, so, no. It, it needs to be bespoke and so we possibly need to take a bit more of a strategic view um yeah. and, and, and sort of update it on a more frequent basis um in terms of the way that the 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 regulators will respond if there is a breach <clears throat> mm. um the challenge that that presents is it takes a long time for regulatory investigations to um to, to to even start and yes, even look yeah. food um and that's not a criticism of the regulators it's, it's just a fact that that that's why it is and, and, yeah, yeah. And, and and often you know when we're talking to a to a regulator as a as a former regulatory investigator i would go into a firm and i would say look this thing you know it occurred two three four five even longer ago uh, and we need to find out exactly what happened and so mm. 
that creates a challenge within an organization for your record keeping um yes. and your your the decisions that you made because you and i could have a conversation today and and, and make a make a a reasoned decision about um how we're going to uh, you know uh, derive our risk factors um but will we remember in five years or even will we be here in five years you know we might be at different organizations we might you know whatever and so as a business you need to make sure that you're recording the decisions and so the most basic example is where an alert is closed well in five yes. years who closed it why was it closed mm -hmm. because that alert mm -hmm. then becomes uh, falls under scrutiny you need to make sure as an organization that you know why you did it and and mm. again it comes down to that operation operational uh side of it um it creates an additional burden of on on on, on time uh, and and record keeping but mm. but it's essential that we do this because it's critical mm. Absolutely. You know, if the regulator mm. asks you why you did it and the answer is yeah. we can't remember, are you great <laughs> in a defendable position? You're you're not. And 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 actually you know, it's not it's not it's not um it's not uncommon, but we just need to be cognizant that our, our, our decision making needs to be um needs to be recorded. And I think I think the last two really is the challenge with the firm is is, is training and, and and actually more more specifically buy-in as well um mm. it, sanctions is not a compliance department issue it is a business-wide issue um in many jurisdictions it carries a personal criminal liability um and yes. so we we need to be cognizant of of the risk and and, and the controls uh, and so you, you need to make sure that the people within your organization understand the risks and the obligations as well um and, and and to be candid you know in terms of a control environment if you can get the people within the organizations on board you know they understand sanctions they've brought into the control environment essentially you're actually creating a whole new um line of defense you know it's your entire organization uh, and that in itself is an enhanced risk control for your organization um, and I would say, say lastly, um, um, one of the um, big challenges within organisations now is is the outsourcing of controls. And by outsourcing yeah. it within your group, it could be to a third party, it could be the purchase of a of a tool that you plug into your own systems. Um, and that's great because you know you're going to you're you're going to the experts in the field that can can apply them. But your obligation is you have to understand how it works. How is it calibrated? Why is it calibrated in such a manner? And how is that mitigating your risks? Because you, you can outsource the control, but ultimately what, you're, what you can't outsource is, is the ownership and the liability. And so- Yeah, the even when you, Yeah, no, absolutely. And so it's your responsibility to make sure you're understanding why that is enhancing your your control environment. So I, I, overall, it's 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 actually a cultural uh, issue as well, isn't it? From a mindset point of view, for sanctions might not be sexy as bringing in a big billion dollar deal that brings you know a whole heap of money for the organisation, but unless that cultural identity or the cultural understanding is there, the importance of managing those risks and having appropriate controls to protect. The organization and the individuals who work for the organization all the deals you do in the world doesn't matter because it, it's all just going to end up for naught when when the regulator comes in and says you know how did you not screen this person how did you not you know uh, do the right thing so well i'm just um thank you that, that's really interesting and, and uh, i'm just conscious of time we've just got five minutes before we wrap up um just uh, naomi just coming back to you just uh, uh we talked quite a bit about the importance of the the national risk assessments and and the ones that were really good but um for just a, as a follow-on question from that for any institution that is about to commence their institutional risk assessments so if they haven't actually done it um you know what 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 uh, tips might be helpful just briefly if you, you know uh, following on from your earlier comments uh, <clears throat> so I think the first starting point is if your jurisdiction has done a national risk assessment uh, relating to proliferation finance risk, consult it. 
Um, if your jurisdiction has not yet done one, then consult the National Risk Assessment for Money Laundering and Terrorism Financing. Um, essentially, uh, a proliferation finance um, is a financial crime, right? It's, a, it's, it's complex mm. because sanctions evasion it's it's financial crime uh it, it's a, a complex financial crime but it is one nonetheless and traditionally proliferation finance is not going to operate in a vacuum it will operate within uh jurisdictions that are that are um that have weak points uh, that are particularly vulnerable to money laundering terrorism financing so consult your national risk assessment and um, then uh, uh, leverage your existing frameworks. Like I said, you know, you are, uh, you know, most institutions are incredibly under-resourced and mm. you are in a position to really use your risk assessment that you've uh, that you've applied for uh, or the same framework that you've applied for money laundering and terrorism financing. So, you know, who are my customers? Are my customers North Korean nationals? Are my uh, customers uh, individuals who mainly have dual uh, citizenship, uh, China and North Korean? This should be obviously a, a red flag. Uh, are my customers um, ladies who run uh, charities for cats or are my customers uh, working in uh, big construction companies that are based in Africa? Uh, because uh, we know that uh, uh, North Korea uh, has essentially used a number of companies in Africa to build, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 buildings, big statues, such, like, such as the one in Botswana or or Senegal. Um, what kind of products am I offering? My uh, what are my, the products that I am offering to my clients? Are those trade finance products? Because we know that there are some uh, trade, you know, typologies for uh, uh, proliferation finance that are similar to what you observe in uh, trade based money laundering. Um, what channels am I using? Do I know my customers? Am I meeting them face to face or I've never met my customer and I'm using mainly an intermediary, a notary? Um, uh, and where am I operating? You know, what are my geographical risks? What is my jurisdiction and where am I operating? Am I operating in China, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Africa, the US, UK? And what does that mean? Because each one of those countries will have their specific uh yes. indicators, right? Mm -hmm. And this would be your the starting point. Um obviously, I mean I we could have a whole hour uh again to go specifically, you know, Stephen and I I'm sure we'd be delighted to talk for a whole hour about risk assessment. Uh, <laughs> um but you know very neatly in, in three four minutes this is um this is what I would say would be a good starting point. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much Naomi. Um so uh on that note, uh, I guess uh, we don't appear to have any questions in the chat, but we're at the hour. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank our panelists, Stephen Lockwood, Masina Hunter, and Noemi Tambe. Thank you very much for an extremely interesting conversation about an extremely challenging environment, I think, for both financial and non-financial sector. Uh, lots of activity happening, lots of change. And potentially lots of job opportunities for people who are interested in uh, sanctions compliance as well, because there's a heck of a lot of work to be done, I would say. So, you know, it's definitely never a dull moment. So on behalf of the Global Compliance Institute, thanks very much for your contributions today. It's been a, a, a fascinating and uh, uh, very revealing conversation. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, Marcina. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank Thank you for having all us. of you. Um, our new sanctions module is, is live on our website now, actually, at gci-ccm.org. And thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.